Okay. Your name again is? San I was born Sandy Bergen, November 15, 1959, in Mount Clemens, Michigan. And there was an Air Force base less than five miles away from that hospital. And I was taken back to the hospital when I was three years old. My mother um, put me in a blanket. Just I was not sick that morning, and she wrapped me in a blanket and rocked me in her arms and took me to the hospital, and they put me in a cage. And I always remembered it as what I thought was three to four days, but through the extensive therapy, I know it was much longer. And I never forgot a lot of parts of that hospital stay, and other ones started flashing back when I had uh, what I call my awakening in December of 2012, when it was like a bag was taken off my head and I was being led to information and websites and books and I started putting the pieces of the puzzle together of the horrible childhood that I had with all of the sexual abuse and the hospital stay, which I'd like to describe the hospital stay. That would have been in about 1969. I was about three years old. I was put in a cage uh, there was never any vitals taken. We were other children were in the cages around me. And we were let out of the cages to go in the play corner to play with blocks and puzzles and numbers. And the only visit from my parents in those days that I was there was when they came and they brought me puzzles. And I sat in that cage and I solved them one, two, three. And that's what uh, the 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 brain is prepared for the fragmentation through the puzzles and symbols. And they put the commands in. And uh, I remember a, a nurse, that I asked who, there was a door behind my cage, and I asked the nurse who was in that room, and she said, a girl with a hole in her heart. And I remember not being able to eat. I was extremely depressed. Uh, they took me out of, one of the tests I've never forgotten is that they took me out of the cage and wheeled me down a hall. There was another child brought out of the room and I was brought into the room by what I always, even at that age, I thought they were very humanoid looking, a male and female. And they put me on the table and they didn't put anything for lead or if they were x-raying. And they stepped out of the room and looked through a triangle in the, in the wall and put their heads together and said, smile, and zapped me right in the chakra area. And through learning about the program, they very well could have attached an entity to me right then, or they definitely altered my intuition chakra or stimulated my sexual chakra because I was overly sexual my entire childhood. Um, after, after the hospital stay, I would have earaches, and my mom would put drops in my ears, and one drop set would burn and one would, would tickle. And the, I would say they implanted me at the same time. Uh, right after the hospital stay, my cousin uh, was spending the night. He's uh, about my age or a year younger than me, actually. And, they, and I was very excited. My cousin was spending the night, and they put him in bed with me. And I remember the first time I woke up, and it was a rough hand uh, fondling me. And I remember thinking it felt good, and it felt familiar. And through now my my uh, extensive therapy, I've seen that they sexually abused me, would wake me up in the cage just like that. And I remember my eyes popping open and I was like, ooh, this feels good. And it did feel familiar and it went on for years that I, by the time I was six, seven years old, I knew my cousin's penis. I mean, we were having all kinds of sexual night after night. My uh, brother three years older than me molested me most of my childhood and I had blocked that out and then I called I started remembering and I called my brother and I said do you remember when you undressed me in mom and dad's bed and he goes oh no that was in the tent and then boom I had probably 20 incidences that I started remembering uh, that I had blocked out and my brother always through my childhood would call me names and sing songs, fat songs about me. And I had no self-esteem time I was an adult. And um, I remember when I was in second grade, so Anna, you asked me what second grade would have been, six, seven years old. And I'm down, I was down the street and I was in bed naked with a boy three years older than me. And he was trying to put his penis in my, but, and 
his mom opened the door, stormed open the door, and I remember being embarrassed and disappointed because that's what I thought I was. And I would be triggered to go through drawers as a child. And I went in my dad's drawer, and right on top was a big, I was probably seven years old, was a big, thick pornography book with graphic cartoons with, you know, grandpa with granddaughter and sex with animals. And that was my go-to toy as a child. I probably learned to masturbate when I was nine years old and um, did pretty disgusting things that a child should never have done. And I'm pretty sure that they suck off of your sexual energy. And my first husband, and so that's mostly the, the childhood that I had was always having the, the sexual. And my first, that was my second cousin. The parents were the first cousins. And Sharon, I called her the Madame. I think she was a Madame. She um, took us on a tour of the Ford factory her and her sons, myself and, and, and her sons, and it was a private tour. And we went in a side door, and they had us stop and, and look this way and look that way. And from reading what Kathy O'Brien said, the, the, the uh, perpetrators of this like to see their victims out of the bedroom scene. And I realized that my first cousin, Rich, ended up working for Fords. Um, I, the cousin that I had all that sex with works for Fords now. And the Fords are big in Michigan, and I'm pretty sure that they supported this program, this nefarious program. You're talking about the Ford Motor Company? Ford. Gerald Ford went right to Kathy O'Brien's house. Oh, the when Fords, she was the president. Okay. Yes, exactly. And uh, I ended up getting married and having a daughter. And my husband was killed in a car accident when my daughter was one year old. And um, I ended up with this six foot four, blonde hair, blue eyed, I would call him probably a Nordic, uh, who talked to me, got me on drugs, started traveling around the states, talked me into having my daughter stay with my parents, and I would go back and forth to see my daughter. One time I went nine times in a year from New York to Michigan. And I counted, I was in New York City for about 16 years. I probably traveled at least 40 times between New York and Michigan. And the best meal, because I'm sure I was carteling from the handler that I had there, and, the, and the, my brother and my parents were probably contacts in Michigan, uh, I went at least 40 times, drove. <laughs> and the best meal is one that that doesn't know they have anything, doesn't have to be paid, and pays for the trip. And I lived it, and I, like I said, I just put the pieces of the puzzle together starting in December 2012, and, and nothing makes me happier than to expose this because it's generational, and I have three daughters and two granddaughters, and I'm not even allowed to talk to my granddaughters. I haven't seen them since October of last year because um, they don't want me to talk about this. Uh, they don't. They basically don't believe me. My oldest daughter has even the butterfly tattoo on her shoulder, and I think that there's people that do agree to the project, which I would never have agreed You're to. You're referring this. to monarch. Hmm. You're referring to a monarch butterfly. She has the monarch butterfly on her shoulder, and uh, I I've asked her to please. Is the left shoulder here? Mm-hmm. I believe it's the left one. I, it could be the right. But I asked her why she got that, and she said she doesn't know. But her, my grandbaby's dad has told me he's a Mason, and when they, was, they got angry at me, he texted me and said, there's a, a much worse fate for you. You're not going to the one. You should have paid attention to your gifts. And I'm like, oh, now you're, you know, that was total Mason line. You should, should have paid attention to your gifts. And I, I realized that the Masons have been involved in my life. I ended up working as a legal secretary for 25 to 30 years and didn't realize that the Bar Association fees that I paid for them went right to the Crown, which is the Templars, which is the Masons. And they probably had a part of uh, the mind control. I never even heard put the word Masons into my vocabulary until 2012. And, um, and throughout my life, 
I was always with these handlers that got me on drugs. And it was always weird to me that all of these law firms I worked at never did a drug test, ever. And so I was always on something. Now in the United States, uh, is it a law that people do drug tests? Most um, employments have drug tests, yeah. but the law firms, that they never did a drug test, which, you know, I thought and that broadcasting that's... broadcasting and other in, uh, employees... Oh, absolutely, yes. Yeah. So, or if you work in the factories or anywhere, it's always a drug test. Almost everywhere has drug tests now. But the law firms didn't, and I think that was kind of convenient to keep me... Because if they kept me high and distracted, I wasn't going to figure this out. And I haven't done um, hard drugs in eight years now, and I re had... Deep regret over it because what of the What would you guilt. call hard drugs? Uh, crack, heroin. I did it all. I did it all. And for some reason, I was able to function. Maybe I did heroin back when I, when I was 21 years old, but then through the years, I did coke. And then I did some crack on and off for seven years. And I had no intervention. My daughters had to know. I have a tw my, my oldest daughter is 35, my middle daughter is 25, and my youngest is 23. My crack thing went on and off for seven years. And that was from 2004 to seven years would be 2011. Well, now I. I had quit that before, I think the last time I ever used it, it was about 2008. But I never had an intervention. I'm lucky I got off of it. And uh, I was never proud of it. But I realized that's a part they probably were using excuse Because they watch everything you do. The whole program is from cradle to grave. It's from cradle to grave. My last house that I had, I just sold, had cameras on me. They had surveillance lights across the property. I would have people come over for fires, and I would say, okay, it's getting dark. Look over there, over there, over there, and over there. There'd be lights peering through, through the woods right at me because they knew I was going to wake up in December of 2012. So that property was already set up for me to buy. And the mind control is huge. I was mind controlled to... Um, my third, I, I was widowed when my daughter when my daughter was one year old, and then I was married and divorced three times. And one of the husbands actually had we put a black and white floor in our kitchen. He had owl lamps. He abused me. He cheated on me. He beat me, and he was a mason. And I don't didn't even put it together until I started having all of this. Uh, kind of like spiritual guidance where revelations would come to me and, and I'd start putting the pieces of the puzzle together. I know what kinds I, of revelations? Oh, like um, my first husband was killed by the Masons because actually what happened is I went through a big trauma. Before I, my daughter was one year old. We had only been married a couple of years and uh, he molested my niece. And there was never any charges brought against him. He was mysteriously killed in the car accident three months later. And I'm pretty, and, and, his, and my niece's uncle, um, I was led to information that he's a Mason, and his father's first name was even Mason. And uh, I had no clue. I didn't put any of it together. I should have realized that that accident, because he was like uh, driving, and if he was going in the direction that the police report said he should have crashed on the other side, but he had probably was pushed off the road, and his his car was wrapped around a tree. And um, I've had spiritual contact actually too, which I I think is a byproduct of the um, electroshock, because they do, they do fragment your mind and put compartments in, and I've always had these marks on my temples. Even as I used to look and as a kid, what is that? It says they put something on my head. I, I, through therapy, I was able to see something attached to my head and then wiping drool off of my mouth. And then the byproduct is always the moles. I've always had these moles on my face and on my back and stuff from the electroshock. Is that scars when they burn in or what? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I've always had, and it's gotten more prominent as I've gotten older. And, uh, I've told my sister, I, she goes, she, she's like, 
oh, Sandy, they did, she admits that I was in the hospital. She's like, well, it was for a bladder infection. I said, I had no infection. I wasn't sick. I went to the bathroom and it appeared, I had no fever, no pain. I know what a bladder infection is, as had, my daughters have had them. They had pain urinating. And I, I went to flush and it appeared red. Through meditation, I'm pretty sure they gave me something to drink the night before because I remembered, because I have, through meditation, I was able to even see my mother stimulating my clitoris when she was changing my diaper. And my brother was in my crib when I was like one year old. He's four, he's three years older than me, playing with me sexually. And I was bred for it. And I always thought that that was like our secret. I never told anybody anything. And um, through my, Fourth grade, fifth grade, we would have recesses and there would be always groups of bo girls and boys that we would go, we thought we were hiding from the teacher's aides. I mean, it was like Brave New World's uh, uh, childhood where we, were, we would all go together and start kissing and fondling and it went on for two years without one teacher's aide ever interrupting us. And there was all of this kiss, I mean, making out, we're switching boys and girls. It was just like this little sex party every recess. And where was the teachers? Did they see you doing this? I don't, we thought they were hiding. We always, you know they had to have seen us. And in, in my childhood, they um, gave us a lot of hearing tests in that elementary. That elementary school is now tore down. And the hospital that I was at, because I wanted to get the records, because of especially that one test, what did they do, what was it? And they destroy the records 25 years and older, conveniently. Because they, they knew what they were doing. And I truly believe that they know who's coming. We've been reincarnated before, and they know the type of person that I was already, and they manipulated my life. What kind of person were you already? Why? Oh, I would have... Uh, Probably in other lives, I was very righteous and um, honest, and I, like, if I, I kind of get frustrated that I didn't have my awakening 20 years ago because I would have quit my job and homeschooled my kids and not have vaccinated them and, and went, you know, against, you know, I do hate the government very much, and they're, they're supplying war military when there's people starving to death. There's, it's just ridiculous. But, so what sort of help have you had since your awakening? Have you sought help or have you sought any sort of um, compensation for what you've suffered? You know, uh, I was thinking that, wow, if, we, if all of us slaves got together and bid a class act against the government, we could make, we could obviously get some money, but I would want to do it for the publicity more than anything. I, get, I was a legal secretary and a workaholic legal secretary for 25 years. I worked massive overtime and I am on social security disability now. And I, I, as long as they leave my disability alone, I don't care about money anymore. I just want this program to be revealed that the CIA is capable of doing this and that the Masons are not good. They're not, they, they, um, they hurt their own children. And um, what happened with my last altar that kicked in, I was always a Christian. I, somebody how I prayed as a little baby, I had my prayers down at the very end, I would say, and forgive my enemies for they know not what they do. Who taught me that? I don't know. And I was um, confirmed Lutheran. I went to catechism for three years. I used to wear my little Christian cross and go on Bible study on lunch hour. Got rebaptized as an adult at a place called Brooklyn Tabernacle in New York City. And um, always would read the proverb every day and read and read. Well, when my last altar kicked in in December of 2012, I could not stop reading the Bible for eight to 10 hours a day, every day, every day. I mean, I went right back to the beginning because I, I was reading the Psalms and they're crying out, I know your commandments, I know your precepts, I know your testimony. So I was like, let me go back. And I read it cover to cover many times. I still, to this day, I'm surprised I didn't bring my Bible because I've given myself a break. But I learned a lot. And uh, What did you learn? I, well, the Sabbath is the worship day. If you know that Bible, 
the Sabbath is the fourth commandment and it was very important from the beginning of the book he has chapters in Isaiah and Ezekiel of his people Sabbath breaking he has the blessings of keeping it he, he said his, that he is God or Yahuwah I call him Yahuwah I am Yahuwah I do not change that's in Malachi 3 6 so he doesn't change he's not going to change his worship day and then Jesus Christ Yahushua um, even in Luke 416 he went to Nazareth on the Sabbath he went to the synagogue went to Nazareth and went to the synagogue on the Sabbath as was his habit and some Bibles say as was his custom so his custom when he walked this planet was to worship on the Sabbath and there's a lot of arguments in the New Testament in the New Testament about um, him doing the miracles on the Sabbath and stuff and and shouldn't do that and he's <sighs> The Sabbath is the worship day. He never said to change the Father's commandments. He said to honor them. And then I started, I read the whole cover to cover, and I was reading the, the disciples who he was chosen as the apostles, and that one apostle is, was chosen by Jesus Christ as Paul. They, um, Paul was, Judas Escacart was replaced by Matthias. And Paul was a self-proclaimed apostle, and he wrote 13 of the books in the New Testament and starts all, almost all of them out with, I, Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ. Well, he wasn't chosen by Jesus Christ. He had his little miracle where supposedly he was spoken to. And if it, in the back of Revelations, it says that there'll be a new, when there's a new world and a new heaven, and there'll be 12 foundations and 12 gates. And then... The 12 gates will be the 12 names of Israel, the 12 tribes of Israel. And then the, the foundations, it goes either one is the gates and one is the foundation, will be the names of the 12 chosen by the Lamb, the 12 apostles, the 12 disciples chosen by the Lamb. Paul was not chosen by the Lamb. He's not one of the 12. And he's the one who said, don't let any man tell you what the Sabbath is. That's his, that wasn't, because the New Testament will have words of Jesus Christ, and it's usually in red in the King James, and Paul was the one who said, don't let any man uh, tell you what the Sabbath is, tell you what to eat, and Paul's had some good, has some good stuff. He said, you know, we're not going against flesh and blood, we're going against principalities and spirits in high places. That was Paul. It's not like I totally... I just think Christianity, that if they put the Christianity mind control net in, that it should all be questioned. I mean, the Catholic Church is, does idolry. They worship um, Mary and Paul. And, and uh, if you follow the Bible, you've, well, he's one God. And also, I noticed in, um, there was word with reference to the aliens. The word aliens is in the Bible. And in Jeremiah, and two times in Isaiah, um, there's a reference to a cockatrice. He says in Jeremiah, Behold, I'll send serpents and cockatrices among you, and they will not be charmed. Well, I Google, what's a cockatrice? Well, it's a reptile egg. And in Isaiah, he says, and they'll have uh, wings and the whole, and like it's right there in the Bible. And uh, Sherry Schreiner is uh, very advanced compared to me on that, and she has a great website that she talks candidly about the aliens and how how it's in the Bible and you know the dragons that it's referred to in the Bible is reference to these different you things. You said you met aliens. Mm-hmm. I what type when? Well, so I had a, a, one of my um, last husbands. I was mind controlled to to I met a man from Alabama. Right before I met him, though, I had a friend who said, oh, do you want to make an easy $100? All you have to do is go to this beautiful hotel and sit and listen to songs for three hours. And guess who did it? <laughs> I know. I did do that. And I'm sure that they triggered me because I met him, and immediately I was totally infatuated. And, and he had me move to Alabama. And uh, while I was there, a man at the flea market was following me, and I looked again, and he shapeshifted right in front of my eyes. His eyes turned yellow, his hair, his hair changed, his, his whole, everything changed. And Would you be able to find drawings of these things? Perhaps. 
And I also, um, at my home just last year, I was laying in bed and I was, because I, I was like, they're here. And it was two grays got up to my bottom of my feet and one got on my chest and they zapped me right in the, right in my temple. Can you describe them? They looked pretty much um, with the, the big eyes and... Any further details, it's important. What they're color? High or tall or they were, they were, they were short, they were the small ones and um, they were a, a gray color. They had the gray color, they had the big eyes. And then, I mean, were they almond, up, down, sideways, feet? They were round, so maybe they, sometimes they can send in. Oh, it's just to get the deep, you know, some kind of description. Right. There's different types of greys. There yeah. is. There's the tall greys, there's the short, there's many species out there. And, and most people think that I'm crazy because I've seen ships. I've, um, I can have. Can you describe them? Mm -hmm. Well, at my house, um, I showed Zen Gardner this picture that I'm going to email him because he's like, wow, Sandy. I was doing my dishes and looking over the woods, and there's a poof coming up from the bottom, like a mushroom. Yeah. And then I got my camera, and I took the picture, and above it there was eight orbs, eight lights, and you could see the outline of a ship. And I showed some couple people this weekend, and they're like, I said, I got it. And then I was uh, with my binoculars looking up in the sky, and I saw a ship hovering, going up and down, up and down. And I was with my last handler, and he never wanted the, For instance, if I was listening to David Icke, you know, to be learning, listening to, he, he was like, I don't, you have to use headphones. He didn't want anything to do with my awakening or helping me. So I finally, he moved out last year in June, and I've chosen now to have to live by myself because I've had at least 14 handlers. I was married and divorced three times, widowed, and in between I had um, two years with this one, four, three years with another one, and they just passed me along, and they were all predators. None of them were good. They stole from me. They cheated me. I used to get beatings. My last beating was in 2010. And from uh, this George who came in my life, they pretend that you're the greatest thing in the whole world. As soon as they meet you, they're like, oh, I'm in love with you, and I would fall for it. And then they start doing these horrible things to me. And, all of they, and I'm sure it's to suck up my energy, to keep my vibration down. And uh, with that hovering ship, I had to go in. I said, Brian, please, would you come out and look at this? And he's like, okay. And he stood there for five minutes, and he's like, okay. I go, do you see what I'm talking about? He said, yeah, I see it, but I don't understand it. I said, well, at least you see it. I'm not going crazy, because it's been hovering there for a half hour before I had the nerve to come in and ask you to please come and look. Can you give any descriptions of what you're seeing? Oh, this hovering thing? It had um, windows. It had... Um, lights and it was uh, I guess oval oval and it was going up and down up and down and I think it stayed there after he went in and I stood there and then finally it flew off did it make a sound no there's no sound and where I'm at up north, I'm up in the country, and I would go out at night, and I would notice things flying over with no sound. They're very, and, and what I captured with the poof and stuff, I've already heard that they can send up holograms to cover up their ships, and I'm pretty sure that's what that poof was coming up first, then the ship came out, and I even drove, because I was at least two miles away where that was coming off, and I can, I will show it to you. Uh, and I've, it looked like you can't see, you can't see the inside of this place where, because the way it gets built up. They have a lot of hidden bases, uh, you know, that we think are trees or, or it may be um, uh, like what you might call a compound where there's, where there's like vehicles parked all over and they have this weird fencing and stuff and then when you look on the satellite it's like wow that's because that's what happened over there three miles from my house I'd go by this place and I said that that's I would get this vibe so I went on Google Earth and looked inside it and it was like a military base in there but they had it looking 
just like it was, you know, um, tractor, uh, campers, and like uh, hobo land. Yeah. But inside, you could see the lights and and, and the different things. And, and I said, well, that sh it shows you that people, they, they're very good at what they do. We have to remember that we've been deceived by the best. And they're not going to tell you what they're doing. So I just been doing my own research, and like I said, I had the um, the Alabama shapeshifter, which um, that mo my husband had said we're going to the flea market tomorrow, and I said great, I like that flea market. We had gone a couple times before. When we got there, I noticed there was nobody there but these tall, dark men standing three in one corner, two in another corner. And then I was walking, and that old man was following me. And then I turned and looked again, and boom, it was just like a Stephen King book. His whole, and he changed right in front of my eyes. And it, into what? Into like a demon's face. He had yellow eyes. The eyes turned yellow. I'll never forget it. He had horns came up. The eyes, the whole eyes. The eyes went like a demon's eyes. Went to yeah, they went sideways, and he had horns come up, and his the hair flamed. How many horns? Did two, you see? two yeah. horns, two horns came up, and I immediately made a full circle around, and I got by my, I grabbed my husband's hand, and he was giggling. So I know that he knew. He was like giggling. And I turned, and these dark men were all standing around me. And at the time, I thought they were breathing down my neck. But now I know they were sucking up my energy because I was startled. I was like, time we got out of that flea market, I had tears in my eyes because it was just so real. And, and then the men just all... Oh.